Welcome to week seven of Introduction to Linguistics. Over the last six weeks, we have been focusing on the structure of human languages. We've looked at phonemes and morphemes and syntactic trees and semantics. So we've gotten some idea of how the internal gears of languages work. Over the next three weeks, we'll use that knowledge to look at how languages are used in human societies. For example, on week seven, we will start looking at sociolinguistics, which is the relationship between language and society, by studying language diversity and language revitalization. We will look at multilingualism and societies that have many languages and how people choose one language over the other. We'll look at language revitalization, which is the effort to make sure that there are speakers for the indigenous languages of the world. On week eight, we will study how languages change. This is called historical linguistics. And on week nine, we'll bring our focus from the global to the individual, to how we make the decisions to project what kind of person we are, how we make our persona. This process is called sociolinguistics. And as you can see, the personal decisions that we make have repercussions which could, uh, for how languages evolve and change and for how language diversity is expressed in the world. So we're going to use our knowledge about structure to study these social phenomena. And on week seven, we're going to focus on, we're going to start with multilingualism. And I do want you to have, to keep these questions on the back of your mind as we move through the week. How many languages do you use in your daily life? Maybe it's just one, maybe you have one and then another when you go to that class. If, if you do uh, have more than one language, when do you speak one and when do you speak the other? Do you sometimes mix them? And if so, what do people think about that? And have you ever been anywhere else where there were more than, lang more than two languages in a society? Which language seemed to be used for what? I want you to keep all these questions in the, again, in the back of your mind as we go through the topics of this week. Because there are, in most of the world, indeed, life is uh, carried out in more than one language. Most of the world, has to live their lives with two or more languages. And there's many ways in which these combinations can be expressed. Uh, in this video, we're going to study multilingualism and diglossia, which are two patterns for how to distribute different languages. In upcoming videos, we'll also study code switching and pidgin and creole languages. So let's start with multilingualism. Indeed, there's many countries in the world that officially have more than one language. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, for example, the government needs to guarantee that it can provide you services in English and in Te Reo Māori, in Māori of New Zealand. The name of the country is Aotearoa, is the land of the long white cloud. And indeed, um, in theory, you can perform any function in society in either of the languages. This is also true in Switzerland, for example, where there are four official languages, um, French, Italian, German, and there's a Romance language called Romance, which is also official in Switzerland. And there must be schools for each of these languages, and the government needs to provide services for the speakers of these languages, and so forth. There's also the case in Canada, for example, where the government needs to speak both English and French. And in Belgium, where the government uh, provides signs in both French and in Flemish, which is uh, related to Dutch. So there's many parts of the planet where you have more than one language. So you have more than one, how do you decide how to use them? There's a model by a linguist called Del Himes called speaking. And I don't want you to memorize all of this, but I do want you to focus on the first two things, on the setting of the conversation and the participants of the conversation. So our decision for whether we're going to use one language or another is based on where the conversation is taking place and who is involved. For example, maybe you'll use one language when you're sitting in a class at Dartmouth. Maybe you'll use a different language when you are having lunch with your friends at a restaurant. So both the setting and the participants uh, weigh in the decision of which language to use. Let's look at an example. Let's look at uh, an example from Hawaii. Hawaii is an archipelago in the Pacific, and the original language of Hawaii is called Hawaiian which is a Polynesian language related to the Maori of New Zealand, for example. We have Hawaiian and we also have English. And over time, a third language developed, which was a mixture of Hawaiian, English, 
and the languages of other people who arrived in Hawaii. For example, people who spoke Portuguese, Cantonese, Tagalog, Japanese, who were there to work in the sugarcane plantations, for example. So the mixture of all of these created a new language called Hawaiian Pidgin English, which is actually a Creole, but look at that on video four. But the speakers of the language call it Pidgin. So many people in Hawaii speak English and Hawaiian Pidgin English. So how do you decide which of the two to use in your daily life? You need to look at the setting of the conversation and the participants of the conversation. If you're a college student in Hawaii and you're with family you and you speak Pidgin, you're probably going to use it with your family. If you're with your friends, you're also probably going to use Pidgin. If you're at school, it gets a little bit more complicated. If you're talking to a teacher and the teacher is from Hawaii, is a local, then you'll probably use Pidgin with them. However, if the teacher is your boss, then you'll probably have to use English with them. So both the setting and the participants are playing a role in your decision to use Pidgin or English with someone. There are societies where the decision has already been made for you, where there are settings where you need to speak in one language and settings where you need to speak in a different one. For example, you might have very formal settings like writing, like being in a university classroom, and you might have uh, relatively informal settings like speaking at home with your friends or at the market and so forth. And if there's a strict reglementation for like there's one language that should be used for the formal situations and another one for the informals, we call the situation diglossia, which is the use of two languages in the community and these two languages have a clear separation of, of when they should be used. The, the most notorious situation of the glossia in the world is the situation of Arabic. So throughout the Middle East, people always have to speak two languages. When people write in Arabic, they're writing in a language called Modern Standard Arabic, which is derived from Classical Arabic. When people speak in Arabic, they're speaking a different language, language which is called Colloquial Arabic. So modern standard Arabic is the formal one and it's used for formal settings, university and so forth. And the colloquial is used with your friends, and amongst family and so forth. And everyone has to be conversant in both of them. Let me show you just how different they are. The first sentence is in modern standard Arabic and it means I love reading a lot. And now hibbul tirata kathiran. This is how it's written. Now look at how different it is in the local colloquials of these regions. In Morocco, for the same sentence, you would say in, e in Egypt, In the Persian Gulf, like in the United Arab Emirates, you would say So these are completely different. Not only are they different from one another, they're very different from modern standard Arabic. And so when you are writing an essay, you would need to use this language, MSA. And when you talk to your friends, you would use, need to use one of these other languages. And notice by the way that the definition of what a language is, is political. It depends, um, it's not about structure because these two objects here, Spanish and Portuguese, are very similar. Uh, they mean, this, these also mean, I love reading a lot. Me gusta mucho leer. They're almost identical, but we call them different languages. However, these uh, two, Modern Standard Arabic and the colloquials, are very different from one another. And yet many people would describe them as being variants of the same Arabic language. And again, these two, the definition of what a language is is political more than structural. But as you can see, MSA is very different from the colloquials. And there's many colloquials around the uh, Arab-speaking world. So in all these regions, the newspaper would be in one language, modern standard Arabic, and then your conversation with your friends would be in a different language, the local colloquial. It's as if, imagine in Europe, wherever they speak Romance languages, all the newspapers were in Latin, and then all the conversations were in French, and Italian, and Spanish. But 
your essays would be in Latin and then your conversation with your friends would be in Spanish. This is how different these two are. This is diglossia. So most of the world does live in societies that use more than one language. And the choice for which language to use is usually based on the setting of the conversation and the participants of the conversation. And there are societies where there is a, uh, a more formalized separation between the two languages, where there's a language with, that's used for formal settings and another one for informal settings. We call this diglossia. The archetypical example of diglossia is uh, the Arabic language in the Middle East.